Next, we have software in the cloud. That's the, what the next talk is about. And next to me is Jan from the Netherlands. Hi, Jan. Good to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and uh, Jan has been developing software for the well over 15 years. Uh, currently, he's working at Ford.net as a cloud solution architect and is awarded by Microsoft with the Microsoft MVP award. His main focus at the moment is on developing highly performant and scalable solutions using his awesome service provided by the Microsoft Azure platform. Because of his expertise, he has been able to help out multiple customers to bring their on-premises solutions to the cloud and guide them towards a better software development ecosystem. He also writes a blog. I guess you put the name of it somewhere in the presentation, hopefully. It's all, it's all in the end. Okay, yeah. okay, so we'll see it. So a round of applause for Jan, and as always, questions in the pine and after in the session. So a round of applause for Jan. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a consultant at a small consulting firm uh, called Ford.net. And what I do over there is, well, migrating stuff to Azure or expanding their footprint. Uh, what this means, I see a lot of customers, a lot of projects, and a lot of pitfalls they all run into or I've learned. Uh, so that's what this uh, session is, uh, is about, my learnings, my findings, and stuff. Well, I hope to uh, learn you something uh, so you won't run into the same pitfalls. Uh, because most of the time when I'm at co a customer on-premises, they have this massive monolith doing all of the things and maybe one or two Windows services also doing some things, but it's all rather tightly connected. Uh, sometimes it's even like 10, 20 years old software, uh, which is fine because it works, it makes the money. But when moving to the cloud, you probably want to refactor something on it because even while you can migrate this to the cloud, it's not beneficial for you or your company to, to well have to have this. So what a lot of people want to do is go all microservices. Uh, so a lot of well small services doing their own little thing and also being connected, like this stack of pebbles. And when you move one of those pebbles, well, you know what happens, just like in a Jenga tower, it all falls down eventually because most monoliths look a bit like this uh, this Jenga tower with lots of small components and they all lean on each other. So this session, it's about my findings. It's about what I've learned there. And what I've learned, there is no silver bullet uh, to, to, uh, to uh, your solution or to any solution. Uh, everything has to be, well, uh, uh, checked for your own customer, your own project, and your mileage may differ from mine. Uh, some people say we go all in Kubernetes because that's the future. I don't agree with that statement, but it might uh, work for you. Uh, so w what we did in, uh, in, in the past, or a couple of projects ago, is uh, uh, the first thing uh, we wanted to do at this customer is have something in the cloud to start. So we started with a database, and the database was connected to some other repositories like Salesforce, SharePoint, SAP, you name it. We, we, had, we had it and we wanted to uh, connect data between those services uh, with, with the dat database. And we had an integration API created because we don't want to have every service uh, to have knowledge about Salesforce, SAP, whatever, because that's hard or at least I think it's hard to communicate with those services. So we had this integration API. And because we want to make, make money, we also had a business to business uh, API where partners could connect to, to retrieve data because some of the data we have about, well, our customers at this project was uh, interesting enough for the partners to, to query, or at least they wanted to query this so we could monetize the data a bit. So we had this kind of a design. And this, this works. This is a good startup solution, or at least I think, still think it's good enough. Um, then we noticed some of the partners were so eager in getting the data, uh, they were now somewhat DDoSing our system. So we added the API management in front of it so we could do some throttling and have some bronze, silver, and gold tiers. Uh, to monetize the, the data even more. 
and a management API because we want to have the, the well the, the account managers being able to uh, d uh, differ the, the partners uh, for their levels. We don't want to have developers uh, do, doing this kind of stuff. So this is the solution we had at, at some point in time with three app services doing their own thing. And well, we had a lot more, but it's a bit simplified. So in the end, we had like 40 app services running, doing their, doing their own little thing. So that was quite costly. And then someone read a book about microservices and uh, thought, well, what I've read, a microservice should be doing one little thing and do it well, which is true-ish. Uh, so uh, then a bank came by right after we uh, uh, read the microservices books and blogs and whatever. And we thought, well, uh, well, the bank wants us to import data, uh, like, like uh, payment data and they provided it on some kind of FTP server. We had to get it at some points in time, parse the data, because if, you, if you've ever worked in the payment sector, you know it's quite hard to get the data. It's encrypted multiple times with very strange algorithms. Uh, so we had to, to decrypt and parse it, and then uh, modify the data so, uh, to a usable, usable model we could be using in our, well, in our ecosystem. So we thought that's three little things we need to do. Retrieve data, parse it, and model it. So three different microservices. Because we had to share state and didn't want to send it all over the line on every request, we ha had one database. Let's say it, uh, it's the state database, uh, which we kept the state of, well, where the zip files were, uh, what the unencrypted data was, uh, stuff like this. So it looked a bit like this. And this worked fine in development, in test, even in the acceptance environment. But then the production environment, which also worked for a week, because what happens is we had created one, serv one distributed service, uh, which is kind of a distributed monolith at this moment in time. Because whenever something happens in, in one of those, those apps, everything breaks down. So if the processor breaks, uh, we have the parser and the timer web job also getting an exception because they were doing uh, 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 invocations, HTTP requests to each other, uh, do like uh, update uh, file one and the file uh, data was stored in the state database. Uh, so this well blew up in our faces. Uh, but what we noticed a bit later on, like eight days, is, uh, is we didn't create one, well, one distribute, one small distributed monolith. We had created a massive distributed monolith because, as you can see, when, when this, this one failed, uh, uh, when the integration API failed, everything would fail because everything was tightly connected to each other via HTTP request or gRPC or whatever uh, whatever communication we were using at the moment. Uh, so that, that's quite a bad design, or at least that's what we figured. So what should we be doing? Well, we should have designed this completely differently because this was the wrong approach. And I see this kind of approach happening at lots and lots of customers because everyone thinks a service should be as small as possible. Which is true, but designing microservices or going to the cloud uh, has, has a lot of benefit from the, from the well, the, the well-known solid principles, uh, the well-known software design principles, like the single responsibility and to keep it simple. A service should be doing one thing and doing it well. That doesn't mean it should be as small as possible. It should be, it, it means you should have one domain, one thingy doing everything in this domain. So a microservice could look like this. This is a proper microservice in my opinion, because a microservice design is an architectural design. It doesn't say anything about how your software should be designed. So what I've got over here is, I can see it over there, is, uh, is an app service, which is a simple API doing some validation requests, uh, stuff like this, 
a storage queue or use whatever queue you have. So the, the app service, whenever it's a request is being invoked, it sends a command to a queue and a function is picking it up and set uh, pushing the state inside a database. The, the Cosmos database has a change feed, also invoking a function, uh, doing uh, some, something with the SQL database if you want, and having a Redis cache in the design because everyone loves caches. Uh, so that's, this is a proper design in my opinion, and this is what we refactored to uh, after, after a couple of iterations. It takes a lot of time. So I, I don't know if you know this or have seen the Ignite uh, uh, announcements, but nowadays you can also use, instead of functions, you can use the, the container uh, the container apps, which is a, it, it's a, is a new icon, uh, and it's super cool. I haven't used it yet, but I wanted to mention it because it's so cool. And what I'm doing over here also is, is having this queue in place. I also have event grid all the way in the, in the, in the, well, in the back, because whenever something has happened within this service, uh, I want to push this to, well, whoever wants to know about it. So that's the, the keep it simple. Every service over here, every implementation uh, is doing their own little thing and doing it uh, well quite well without any, any coupling to each other. Uh, and then we have this, this dry principle, like the do repeat yourself principle, which also is uh, very valid in, in this kind of design, because what I see happen a lot is people using NuGet packages to share code or NPM packages or whatever packages, or creating lots and lots and lots of abstractions just to reuse a couple of lines of code. And I can see why we're doing this and why we're still doing this, but it's an anti-pattern in my opinion, or at least at this moment in time, because it's much easier just to have a small block of code or a massive block of code inside your flow, because then you have one file open with all logic. Sure, there are some nuances to this statement, but I think you should be repeating some business logic all over your services. And if you start noticing, I'm copying and pasting lots and lots and lots of business logic across lots and lots of services, you might have to think about your overall design of your domains because maybe your domains aren't correct set up uh, wh whenever such a thing happens. Uh, as as Sandy Metz has, uh, Sandy Metz has uh, uh, once quoted on a conference, duplication is far cheaper than the wrong abstraction. This is what I noticed that some customers I had created, well, as I mentioned, lots and lots and lots of abstractions, lots and in of interfaces, base classes, uh, and whenever I needed to debug some error, uh, and, and going through the, through the call stack, it were like 9 to 20 files I had to open and go through in order to get to the actual logic which was failing. So duplication is cheaper most of the times because you can see in one, one, well, uh, one file, maybe two, uh, what is happening in your code. So that's th something to be aware of. Uh, then we have the, the loose coupling. As you saw in, in the diagram I, I uh, shown you, uh, I'm using queues and event grid because this, this means I don't have any coupling with it between my services. I'm just sending messages to queues, events to event grid or whatever service you prefer. And the, the, the producer doesn't know what will happen. And if the consumer of this message uh, is, is failing, it doesn't matter. The, the, the message, the command will be sent to a poison queue, a dead letter queue, uh, whatever, and you can monitor this. N nothing is broken. Your user isn't interrupted in the process. So loose coupling is, is great, great to use. Uh, which Azure services to use? Uh, it depends on who you ask. I like storage queues. Uh, yesterday evening I had a discussion with, with someone uh, who loves uh, service based queues and service based topics uh, and, and he declared me nuts for using storage queues. Uh, choose whatever you want. Service bus is awesome. It has lots and lots of cool features. I'm not using most of it. I'm not using most of them uh, uh, all the time. And storage queues is like zero euros. So it's, yeah. 
it's useful enough for me because I'm only using it to send messages to backend systems. If you need uh, uh, the power of Service Bus, I definitely advise using it because it has lots of capabilities. You can even use the premium tier and have Fnet integration with uh, the, the Service Bus, which is quite powerful if you're running in a production system or an enterprise system. Mm. There's also the event grid topics, which is, well, meant, event grid is meant for events. It's, si it's similar to service bus topics. I also see projects, people using service bus topics for sending events across uh, their, their domains, which is fine, but I would be using event grid because it can handle, um, well, much higher load. So I mentioned events and messages a couple of times. Uh, there are differences uh, between them, and this is something which I need to clarify. What, so what's an event? An event is, I, I found this quote on the Microsoft Docs, an event is something you send out in the open and you have no clue who or what is consuming this. Uh, and it should be as small as possible, because if you're sending very fat events, uh, and it, you change something in this event later on, you have no clue who is, if, uh, who has a uh, has, uh, negative impact uh, for, for this change. So it should be as small as possible. Uh, so in, in a message, a command, uh, whatever you want to call it, it can be as fat as you want because it stays inside your domain. You want a user to be created, like a create user event. So for this uh, message, so for this message, you need a username, a password, uh, first name, last name, etc. Uh, so it can be as big as you want, because your backend system needs all of this data. And it stays within your domain, so whenever you change it, you know what will break. So the content of a message, like I mentioned, it can be as fat as you want. Uh, all the data you need, because you know uh, what's needed within your domain. Then we have the event, it should be as light as possible. I like uh, uh, having events. Uh, being very granular, like user first name updated, something like that, instead of user updated, because that doesn't say anything about what has been updated about this user. Uh, and one service might be interested in the, the first name uh, has been updated, the other only wants to uh, know something about age of a user. So that be very granular with this. This also means you only have to send identifiers or the, the actual, well, the age of a person or something like this. Uh, and well, this is, uh, this is the design, what I uh, fall back to nowadays uh, about almost all the time, having the API, having a queue, having a uh, function. And over uh, down at the bottom, I have the signal R service drawn because uh, Azure Functions, uh, I don't know if you know it, but Azure Functions have super cool triggers and bindings. Uh, and these bindings make sure you, it's rather easy to s uh, interact with different services within Azure, like the SignalR service. Uh, you can just say, I want to send an event to SignalR and be done with it. No plumbing, no authentication nowadays, because the, the, the new libraries have been G8 like one or two weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, which means you can go all passwordless within Azure, uh, which is awesome. Uh, so only working with AAD uh, accounts. So this is uh, quite cool, sending um, events back to the client. So whenever I'm changing my first name, uh, I can get notified asynchronously uh, your username has been updated or your order has been processed. If I'm buying something on Amazon, uh, I guess they have a similar kind of design. So the, the website is uh, sending the order on some kind of queue and sending back, could be sending back a message to me in, in the site like it has been processed, it will be delivered the next day. So all cool. Uh, yeah, this is something I created, a super cool animation. <laughs> so I need to show this. It took me quite a long time to do this and yes, uh, the booking has been created now. The booking is sent back to the, to the clients and uh, it's notified. 
but you can also use the same bindings or a different binding but the same uh, stuff to communicate with the fan grid so if your function has two output bindings uh, one for signal r and one for a fan grid you can use the same messages or uh, different messages within one flow you don't have to think about all the plumbing of doing stuff just add another binding and be done with it same goes for adding records and databases uh, uh, lots of other bindings also so that's that's quite useful also as i mentioned booking created booking has been updated i'm not very happy with the booking updated because it doesn't tell me anything but you get you get my point so what are the good practices as i mentioned keeping them as light as possible preferably just an identifier uh, at one at one project we also did the old state and the new state uh, sending it in within the uh, event which was useful unless you have uh, uh, messages events coming out of order uh, on the consumer which is a hassle so you have to think about this by sending some kind of e-tag or, or version or whatever mm. while we're on the on the subject of events and queues one thing we noticed is whenever you're using event grid topics and have a subscription to it you can hook it up to functions or other type of webhooks uh, which might sound like a good idea at the time and it probably is within your dev test acceptance environment it's not in production because your functions will go down at some moment in time be because of a developer error because of the function runtime crashing because of depending on the moon and the sun whatever solar flares so whenever your function isn't responding and picking up an event the event is lost there is some dead lettering uh, in, in event grid, but that's hard to get the messages out. So what we're doing nowadays is putting a queue in the middle. So having event grid topics, the subscriber is a storage queue or a service bus queue uh, because those services are always up. Uh, they have like, well, not, not officially, but they have like a 100% uh, uptime, which is more as your code or my code at least. Uh, so this is a good idea and whenever a message is lost it's just placed on the poison queue or the dead letter queue and it's rather easy to get them off of there so that's a good idea uh, we're doing this at well all of, them, all of the customers nowadays because we want to have all the messages which are being sent to us uh, bad practices yeah like i mentioned sending lots of data within events not a good idea because this means uh, you will get a tight coupling of your data within one domain to the different domains so you should be keeping them light uh, and if you're sending these bloated events uh, you don't have a distributed monolith anymore like making http calls to different services uh, all the time now you have an event driven distributed monolith which is the worst kind of design i've come across uh, because now you don't know why events are being sent why there be a uh, why state is being in an error error in the state uh, so this is this is quite bad i've i've seen two or three projects where we had this uh, and it took us lots and lots of time to to make this a, in a better state uh, we, we first started by well making the events lighter and doing more of a distributed monolith because even though that's bad it's easier to, to bug track. So then we have the open for extension, the open close principle, which also applies to, to this, uh, this design when you're designing something in the cloud. Uh, you want to add multiple services all the time. So uh, when you're making a web shop, you probably want to have a search in there, a catalog, an inventory, and at some moment in time you decide we also need a checkout basket because we want to make money and then you also need some kind of a payment provider so you want to extend your architecture your design within azure but you don't want the payment uh, processor to have an effect on the inventory because they're completely different domains and shouldn't be connected with each other. So it should be closed for modification between those domains. That's also where the do repeat yourself uh, comes from 
because there might be similar logic within those domains. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's exactly the same. The logic doesn't has to be changed at the same time, or at least it might not have to be changed at the same time, uh, depending on uh, on the logic. So you you well, you should be uh, keeping this uh, uh, as simple as possible. So how to get there? Well, doing it in uh, in the DevOpsy way, like uh, like planning, coding, fixing, and uh, you've probably all seen this 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 uh, this diagram lots and lots of time at lots and lots of conferences. Uh, and this takes a lot, a lot of time because you can't do this at once. Uh, when moving your monolith to the cloud, uh, that's a bad idea, but splitting it up in microservices, uh, most of the time also is a bad idea, at least if you want to do a big bang. So you should be doing it, at, uh, well, at, at small steps. Uh, and in the end, what's the easiest setup, in my opinion, is uh, coming up with, well, getting getting to this kind of a design, having lots of databases, persisting state, uh, having some app services, some functions as, as workers uh, doing their own thing. Uh, and this is good, or at least it works, only your bill will be quite high because you have to pay for all those app services, you have to pay for all those databases. Uh, and as mentioned at some moment, we had the project with 40 to 50 app services and someone thought it would be a good idea to have them all in their own service plan. So we were paying like 50 times 60 euros for the S1 instances, which was quite, uh, well, not fun when the financial manager called, what are you doing? Uh, so that uh, we had to change this. But in order to change this, we had to know what services need high availability which services can go down whenever we want and which services are well medium medium risk so you have to determine your SLA uh, for for the service uh, so at the, at the traveling uh, agency I've worked at uh, you can imagine having the search uh, with a high uptime and having a, a booking service with a high uptime is quite important because users are uh, searching for, for vacations and booking them. Having backend systems for the employees should also be up most of the time uh, because otherwise your employees can't work. But if they have some off time, like 30 minutes, it's annoying, but okay, your company isn't on fire whenever that happens. And then you have some background workers, like they can go down whenever you want because they're in the background to doing the thing whenever they need to. Uh, so we drawn some uh, circles around uh, our services. Uh, the red ones are high priority. Uh, the orange ones were yeah, for the employees, the, the, the intranet uh, stuff. And, and the yellow ones were like, yeah, okay. It should be working all the time, but w we don't actually care that much. When it's not working, uh, we can take our time. Uh, so. Then uh, this is how we, how we determine the, the SLA for those services. And then we noticed it's quite hard to move uh, uh, app services between service plans or resource groups or whatever. Uh, so that, that quite was quite hard to do. We're still busy with it. We also wanted to move from Windows to, to Linux instances, which is, uh, well, a difficult transition on itself. Well, not code-wise, but more uh, 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 infrastructure-wise. Uh, won't be talking much about that today. So someone came up like, yeah, I'm a Kubernetes expert. I know this is possible within Kubernetes because you can just have priorities for your pods and they will be up all the time, which is true or ish. Uh, Kubernetes is awesome in this. Because, uh, so if we had placed all of this within Kubernetes, all of us, our app services, our, all of our websites and workers, it would be rather easy to have high priority uh, pods and uh, lower priority pods. Uh, then we would have the complexity of Kubernetes, which is a, a story on itself. But it is quite good for these kind of scenarios. Uh, you even have the, the, the ACI, the, the, the vertical pods. Uh, so uh, if you, uh, the Azure Container instances, 
you can specify them to have uh, nodes on demand or, or at least fast nodes on demand. So whenever you have a spike, an immediate spike in your, in your uh, traffic and your usage, an ACI can, uh, uh, instance can spin up and add some pods to it. And when the, the traffic is uh, lo lowered, uh, it can spin down also, which is faster compared to adding new nodes to the cluster. So this could be a solution, putting everything in a cluster. But as I mentioned, I'd like to keep things simple and use services what they're good at. So using solely Kubernetes isn't something I fancy doing. At the moment, I'm on a project where we're doing everything within Kubernetes. Uh, and it works, but it's we have to do a lot of plumbing, a lot of stuff just to get things working. And if we would have been using app services or functions or logic apps or whatever, uh, the development would be uh, much easier for a lot of tasks uh, we're doing. So uh, yeah, just because you can do everything within Kubernetes or whatever uh, cluster uh, you're using, uh, doesn't mean you should. I don't know if, you, if any of you knows who has said this the first, so then I can update the slides. If you know, please uh, please uh, ping me later. Mm. I like to mix and match uh, stuff. I like to add, like I mentioned, add so, uh, use services what they're good at. So if I'm only use, uh, if I only need to push a message to some queue and pick it up and don't need any fancy other stuff, I'm using storage queues. If I need fancy uh, queuing mechanism, I'm using service bus because it's awesome. If I'm using, if I only need an a API, use a, an, an app service. Don't create a whole cluster, a Kubernetes cluster to do this. So what I like doing, or what I like doing nowadays, or want to experiment with, is a, a better term because I'm still at the Kubernetes uh, project. Is come up with something like this. We have lots of workers at the moment in in our uh, pods. And those workers are, uh, we have a lot of plumbing to uh, contact, uh, to, to listen to service bus queues, which is okay. But we could also do this, this processing within Azure Functions and use the bindings and the triggers available to us. So the Azure Functions team will make sure it works and we don't have to worry about, uh, do we need to open or close a socket? Uh, do we need to uh, peek a message or delete the meshes or whatever. It's, it's just being handled for you. Uh, so that's uh, something we're transitioning to now. And whenever this is done, which will take quite some time in, in this uh, project, we can do other cool stuff because that opens up the world to using even more services within Azure. Like something like this. Because if we, we also have a lot of sites, and you have static sites uh, within Azure, uh, which is, well, faster compared to going all of through Nginx and Kubernetes and stuff like this. A, a static site is just some HTML which is being served, could also be served from a CDN. So we want to, or I want to add this to the mix for our sites. Then have an app gateway as an ingress controller for Kubernetes because it's cool. So now we don't have to use Nginx anymore as a gateway or security or, or uh, something like this. It's just being handled in the app gateway, which is doing a lot of security stuff and can act as an ingress controller. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, but if you have Arc enabled clusters within Azure, you can also run pass services within your cluster. It's not something I would advise doing on your first try, but it's possible. So. Even if you're running locally on premises or on Amazon or on Google or wherever you have Kubernetes installed, if you make it Arc enabled, you can use app services, functions, event grid, I think even service bus within your Kubernetes cluster by just adding those services uh, to, to your pods. So this is awesome because having app services uh, has a couple of benefits to just hosting up uh, a, a new pod uh, with with uh, port uh, 443 open or port 80, whatever you're exposing uh, stuff with, and we're using a lot of uh, a lot of uh, SQL now, which is okay-ish, but we're also using SQL to store 
a lot of JSON, which is like, why aren't we using Cosmos DB? So that's also next steps. Uh, so using the service, which is uh, logical to use uh, for, well, uh, whatever problem you're trying to solve. I know from the on-premises world, uh, you have people uh, who are working, or at least the projects I was at, yeah, we're doing this like 20 years now, like having IIS or whatever web server, publishing the site to there and having a SQL server and no messaging or whatever, because that's hard, it's hard to maintain, it's hard to uh, understand, stuff like this. Within the cloud, it's just a checkbox or, or just uh, add new resource or whatever. You should be using infrastructure as code though, but it's easier to set up and you don't have to be an expert in maintaining the stuff because that's something the Microsoft uh, teams are doing. So adding all of those services to the mix will make your life easier as a developer, as an ops person, and even as a manager later on. Sure, you just need to do, you need to know some stuff uh, of what's happening, but uh, it's, it's, this is looks complex and overwhelming at first, but it's quite, all right, because you grow into this. It doesn't have to be this way at day one. You can do this on year five or maybe even later, whenever it makes sense. So, as I mentioned, this is a lot of work. It will take you a lot of time to, to get there, uh, but it's something I think you should be doing when moving to the cloud and rather sooner than later. So just moving your big exe file or whatever file to to the cloud and run it over there will probably work but you will get a lot of uh, downsides from it uh, after a couple of days weeks maybe months if you're lucky so uh, yeah uh, splitting it up in more cloud native solutions is a better approach it will take you a lot of time so that's it uh, for, for me today uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me later on. Uh, here are some, some links, some details of me, uh, the GitHub repo, I'm on Twitter. If you have a long question and I'm not here anymore, you can also email me. Most of the time I'm quite, quite fast to respond, unless I'm at the conference. Uh, <laughs> and if you want to read more on, on Azure stuff, uh, feel free to <coughs> check out uh, my blog. Thank you all. Thank you, Jan. <coughs> Thank you, Jan. Um, I'm watching uh, Pine. Uh, there is, looks like no questions. Still, you can write those down if you if you want to. Uh, audience online, uh, I'll see it. When I, oh, we have some. <coughs> so, Victoras is asking. You talked about putting a storage queue in between Event Grid and Azure Function. How does it help? Is it because Azure Function checkpoints irrespective? of the fact that an exception has occurred? Is there a way to replay messages from the storage queue? Yes, so the question is, why the heck are you putting a, a queue in between event grid and, and your function? Because your function has to do all the stuff. That's true. And uh, like I mentioned, when your function is crashing for some reason, it might be my error because I've uh, deployed a, a, a wrong function, uh, some dependency injection uh, uh, registration missing or whatever, this function is down. So whenever event grid tries to send a message to it, it will fail, it will get an, uh, uh, it will get an error and it will retry a couple of times, I think by default five times within 24 hours. Uh, but if it's in a weekend and you don't have monitoring on it, it will be put on a dead letter, on a dead letter, well, a storage account, if you're lucky, if you have configured this. Uh, and that's what we found out the hard way. Like in a weekend, there were like 7,000 messages in some storage queue and we had a hard time picking them out. So what we're doing now is just putting a queue in between because it has a higher uptime and is less prone to error. Uh, and whenever the function isn't up or it has an error, it won't pick up the messages because it's not there to pick up the messages. Uh, so the, the queue will well, fill, fill itself up and you can have monitoring on it. On it. But even if the function is picking it up uh, and it has some error uh, somewhere deep in your code, uh, it will uh, be put to the poison queue or that letter queue when 
when, after a couple of retries, I'll think five by default. Uh, and it's easier to replay them from there because uh, if you're using like Visual Studio, you can just uh, cut and paste them at different uh, uh, queues. Uh, you also have some monitoring tools for this. So it's, it's easier for maintaining. So it's, it's a bit infrastructure overhead, but on the operating side, it's easier. So thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Victoras, for a great question. Do we have any questions here in the audience, maybe? I'm, I'm coming closer to see you. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah I see it. Uh, can you say it out loud? Can you say it out loud, the question? Yeah. Uh, so actually, uh, because you, uh, you presented uh, uh, H2O for uh, queues and uh, topics, but you didn't mention even hubs uh, at all, is there any reason for that, that, that you uh, prefer to use event grid or something else than event hubs? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, you mentioned a couple of messaging uh, services uh, within Azure, but you didn't mention uh, Event Hub and uh, IoT Hub for that matter. Uh, and that's because uh, I think Event Grid, or I think uh, Event Grid is, is actually meant for sending events uh, and, and the queues and uh, like storage queues and subscription uh, 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 service bus stuff is, uh, is meant for sending messages. And Event Hub can uh, can do the, the event grid stuff or, or the, the, the sending messages to, to each other. Uh, but it's meant for such high, well, it, it's, yeah, it, it's meant for very high uh, 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 throughput of, of messages, like in IoT scenarios, if you have thousands of uh, devices uh, connecting to your cloud, it makes sense to have Event Hub uh, in between because it's able to process like I don't know if it's millions or trillions of messages uh, in a short amount of time, but it's it's meant for this this type of stuff. And you have partitions over there, like 32 partitions. So whenever you send a message over there, uh, it will well get into one partition, and it can it will be picked up at some moment in time. But you have to be in luck; it will be uh, in the in the right order or uh, whatever. So there are uh, things you can do to make it work. I just think it it's harder to do compared to service bus or storage or event grid. Yeah, does, it, does, that, does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, great, do we have any more questions to the end? Uh, here I can see that. No, so in that case, let's give a round of applause for Jan. Thank you very much, Jan, for presenting. Thank you all.